Well, thank you very much for the welcome, Alan. You did a bit better than uh, the introduction I had in Sydney last week, uh, where I was making a presentation to a business group, and the um, person introducing me got up and said, the last politician who made a presentation here was Kevin Rudd. <laughs> and a week later, I still have my job. <laughs> so it's been a quiet week in Australian politics. Uh, one of the things that uh, strikes you watching someone else's election is just how much politicians dislike elections. We really don't like them. And uh, the public sector, of course, doesn't have to go through them. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Can I just acknowledge the work of um, the Australian New Zealand School of Government? It's one of those uh, trans-Tasman institutions that I'm sure will develop further into uh, something uh, very useful, even more than it is now. Uh, and we're picking up one or two other ideas. By April next year, we'll have a productivity commission, which is deliberately modelled to uh, run uh, in close connection with the Australian Productivity Commission. Again, another, what w and what will become a trans-Tasman institution from which we both benefit. I want to take a, a deliberately uh, finance minister's view of public sector change and how it might occur over the next 10 years. Uh, but it's a, a review that uh, bears on, that, that comes from um, a number of years watching this. You had Roger Douglas speaking to you uh, yesterday. I was a junior treasury official um, when he was Minister of Finance and uh, went into Parliament in 1990 when the government I was part of was continuing a program of quite dramatic uh, reform in New Zealand. And I've had, of course, many, a number of years in opposition to ponder on the lessons learned. The, <coughs> the finance, I think if one difference a finance minister's perspective gives is it helps answer one question that's really important about reform and policy change. Why would anyone want to do what we want them to do? Uh, or in, I suppose, theoretical terms, an agency problem. Well, one reason they will do what we want them to do is because we've got the money and they need it. There's an awful lot of uh, public policy speak, uh, which is relatively um, attractive and articulate, but if you can't find a reason why people want to do it, then it just doesn't happen because public services don't really need to do anything in particular. That's the nature of the business. Well, over the next 10 years, we're going to see a uh, revolution in public management. Governments around the world are uh, striving to tackle the fallout from the global recession. Uh, and Australia is in a somewhat unique position of probably being under less pressure than any, develop, any government in the developed world to think hard about its public services. Uh, our, our outlook, our fiscal and economic outlook, lies somewhere between the relatively benign outlook for Australia and the uh, very grim outlook for countries like the UK and the US with respect to their public finances. Uh, just to give a bit of context for our uh, view of public sector management in contrast with Australia, I just want to touch on some of our economic challenges. Uh, we heard last night uh, Ross Garno give a description of the Australian economy over the last 15 years, last 20 years, and in many respects they're remarkably similar, uh, with the exception that you have this massive uh, tr terms of trade effect from your resources boom. Uh, but I think if you put that aside, you would find that, uh, like, like New Zealand, uh, in fact over the last 10 years, our growth has been somewhat unbalanced. Uh, in New Zealand it's been sluggish. And too much of that growth has been driven, in New Zealand at least, by excessive debt, uh, overconsumption, and fast increases in government spending. So we need to rebalance a lopsided economy. It's become lopsided in two ways. One is that the tradable sector, or internationally competitive sector, has actually been in recession for five years. It's shrunk. There have been no net new jobs in our export sector in a decade. Uh, that has to change. And secondly, we need to deal with our 
rapid, in, far, pretty rapid increase in external liabilities. Australia owes the rest of the world about 60% of GDP. Uh, New Zealand owes 90%, and ours is rising. Uh, forecasts to rise over the next four or five years. So we need to correct that imbalance. We simply can't keep going to those global financial markets and asking them to lend us money. Uh, and the Australian banks who essentially finance our external liabilities are telling me exactly that today. It is going to get more difficult and more expensive, not easier. So we've set about the task of trying to rebalance our economy with quite a wide-ranging programme of reform after probably 10 or 12 years when New Zealand decided reform was a bit hard and put its feet up. So we are, will be demanding more accountability and effectiveness from the public sector. But probably the main decision we've made so far has been our changes to our tax system. Uh, from 1 October this year, we will be dropping income taxes uh, considerably. The top tax rate will drop to 33 cents. The marginal tax rate on the average wage will be 17.5 per cent. And we're paying for that. Uh, we're also dropping company tax to 28 cents and tax on savings vehicles. And to pay for that, we are increasing GST to 15 per cent from 12.5. Uh, increasing the effective tax rates on property investment and closing a range of uh, domestic and foreign loopholes. And these changes are designed to rebalance the economy, increase our international competitiveness, and so far they have been surprisingly politically acceptable. And in my view, largely because of the policy making process we followed, which I will come back to. Uh, so as a result of uh, the sluggish economic performance, our fiscal position has dramatically reversed in the last four or five years. After 15 years of surpluses, we're now looking at at least another five or six years until uh, we resume surpluses again. And even then, we need surpluses of about 2% of GDP to meet the obligations to the New Zealand Super Fund, which is a large government, large sovereign wealth fund designed to offset the future costs of national superannuation. So that means that in the professional lives of most of our civil service leaders, uh, there will be, there will not be a time uh, when we have the easy money we had in the last 10 years. There will not be a time in the professional lives of our civil service when the government is free to simply increase the price it pays for public services. Uh, we've set some pretty tight fiscal constraints. Uh, over the next four years, we're looking at a 4.8 per cent increase, uh, real increase in government spending, 1.2 per cent per year. It's a bit hard to compare to the um, federal government's 2 per cent real increase per year, except that we know it's lower. Uh, partly because we cover all federal and state activities under one roof. A, a distinct, I'm always reminded what an advantage it is after I spent a day or two <laughs> talking to public servants and business uh, in, in Australia. So far, we've reprioritised over the next three or four years about four billion of spending uh, from low value and ineffective uh, services to higher value uh, frontline and more effective services. However, they are the quick wins from a previous decade of very loose management of government spending and very rapid growth in government spending, since, particularly since 2005. So looking ahead, how are we going to live with these tight fiscal constraints? How are we going to deliver more, as the public are demanding, for less, as our finance markets are demanding? Well, we'll be looking around for new ideas and directions, and to be frank, I don't think they're going to come from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we'll look at the best you can come up with, and we hope you'll look at us. But uh, around the world, we're going to see a revolution in public service management. Uh, the prevailing literature and approach is conditioned, in my view, still by at least a decade of generous year-on-year -year increases in funding and a, a complacency uh, that 
15 years ago wasn't in public services but has come back. The large economic shifts that have occurred, particularly in the UK, US and Europe, means that those governments will spend the next 20 years trying to first stop the massive increase of deficits that they're dealing with now, uh, and then work out how to pay down the massive mountains of public debt that they have built up. I don't think yet we understand that while their economies are going to pick up, their public finances will be a mess for decades to come. So the optimism of the last decade that smart people using the massive resources of government could transform society uh, will depart those societies. That experiment has run out of money in most places probably except Australia, and actually has little that is genuinely transformational to show for it. The new experiments will have less aspirational goals. We will have to sort out which public services and income support measures really matter. Not just which ones people like, but which ones really matter. And we're going to have to work out how to deliver those services for a lot less money. At the same time, another set of experiments are going to go on. Those countries which, have, which are in substantially in surplus, which in our region is largely the Asian economies, are going to be developing internal demand, uh, growth in private consumption, and therefore demand for public services that currently don't exist in those countries. I expect New Zealand and Australia will find, uh, find themselves selling our frameworks for accountability and transparency to emerging economies who are developing their public services and borrowing the cost-crunching innovations uh, that are developed in the debt, uh, the deficit economies, uh, such as the UK, US and Europe. So what are we doing in that context in, in New Zealand with more fiscal, certainly more fiscal pressure uh, than yourselves and, and, and without the benefit of a commodity boom to cushion the otherwise underperformance of our economy? I just want to describe for you uh, how we're thinking about the next five years and some of the factors that we believe will drive further change. We have chosen what we call the responsibility model. Uh, as an incoming government in late 2008, uh, we had a choice of ripping, in, uh, ripping out savings and embarking on a large-scale restructuring plan. However, we're not doing that. Uh, we have left existing structures large, largely in place, uh, but we've set out very clear fiscal constraints over the next four years. We're pushing the responsibility for managing resources onto our public sector chief executives. Uh, so it is not up to the Treasury or the Minister of Finance to ensure that we live within those constraints. It's up to the leadership of the separate sectors of government. So we are stress testing our existing fairly devolved model of public sector management, which is a bit different than it runs uh, particularly in your state governments. There's a couple of reasons why we are working with the existing system. One is just that our election campaign was run prior to the global financial crisis. In fact, we launched a tax package, a major tax package on a Thursday with significant revenue costs and Lehman's went down on the Friday. Uh, the world changed and the Government of Australia announced its um, deposit guarantee.